Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. I'm excited for today's show. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. I'm Lindsay, the Crystal Queen. <laughs> The Crystal Queen, sweet. Uh, thanks for listening to Scared to Death or watch us on YouTube, episode 15. Very excited. I'm, I'm, I'm extra pumped for today's story. I just find today's story is very interesting, so I can't wait for that. Uh, thanks for the feedback on social media. Just just under, her, oh, Crystal Lady, just under <laughs> 3,000 ratings and reviews on iTunes alone. That helps so much. That's how you continue to help us grow. Thank you. By rating and reviewing the show. Uh, reviews also help us improve. You know, most of the feedback's great. Some of the uh, constructive criticism, also great. A uh, couple whiny trolls who I'd probably... Uh, yeah, you're going to get that. Let's I, address it. A cu- couple whiny trolls I'd rather push down an open elevator shaft than have a drink with. Push them. Push them. Uh, the one that cracked me up recently was somebody who was annoyed about um, you having a cold last week. Oh. But I guess... Like, I can help that. Right. And, and, and that's the exact kind of person who, if we would have canceled the show, to not have to... Well, how come they don't do an episode every week? Right. And so, also, like, it was a head cold. Like, I wasn't vomiting on camera. Right, right, exactly. Now, people... It's, Weird. It's, some people are just complainers. But the overwhelming majority of you guys, man, it's so great. We're, we're lucky Thank to you. have you, you uh, so listen k- to our show. You're so kind, people. I don't read the reviews because it's a rabbit hole for me. My self-esteem can't handle it. Uh, yeah. So, I, I, so Dan gives me the constructive criticism. I, yeah, I, I give uh, Lindsay the, o- the overall gist because... I, I, yeah, I can handle it just because um, I don't... I I don't overly value the opinion of any one single person, good or bad. True. Uh, Just the way, just, you know, from doing stand-up for lots of years and stuff. It's like, you know, it's all so subjective. I look for overall trends. Yeah. And if uh, if I'm happy and you're happy and overall the audience is happy, then we're good to go. Yay! Yay! Uh, (laughs) That was not planned. That was Okay, so um, looking forward to hearing what True Tales Lindsay is going to be reading me. I'm loving the My Stories uh, more and more. Me too. Uh, They they freak me out so much. I was up late until like 3.30 last night working. And I just, I can't do the stories in our house or at night. So I had to like get up this morning early and do them because I just immediately, as soon as I start reading them... uh, I usually sit at the kitchen table yeah. to work at our house and there's curtains that go to yeah. our front yard and I just, I can't, I immediately think that there's something going on out there. Uh, my, wife's, my wife's a good egg. She was up super late last night uh, putting together Christmas miracles for, uh, you know, people were helping on Time Suck. Yeah, putting together, fun. Yeah, doing lots of shopping yesterday, making Yay. Christmas special for some some families in need. Yay. Um, and keep sending those stories into my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, I'm very excited for my two tales. And if you want to tell yeah. me anything that's not a story... Mm. Info yeah. at scared to death podcast.com. You will hear directly from me. Yay. Yay. But no stories there, damn it. Don't <laughs> quit trying to trick me. Okay, very different stories today. Uh, a voodoo curse and a possible voodoo priestess ghost sighting in Louisiana. Oh, is that, why you're, is that why you're wearing that's, your New Orleans shirt? That's why I got my New Orleans shirt on today. <laughs> Preservation Hall Jazz, mm-hmm. one of our favorite places. And a Laotian sleep demon that might be able to quite literally scare you to death. Did you say Laotian? Laotian. From Laos. Is it all? Is it like lay, L-E, and then ocean, O-C-E-A, or? L-A-O-T-I-A-N. Oh, lotion. Laotian. Laotian. Okay, okay. I had to picture that in my brain because I was like, are you just trying to say the ocean? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, Laos uh, over there by Vietnam. <laughs> uh, okay, glad we cleared that up. I'm a genius. It, but yeah, there's there's tales of this um, in, in this uh, Hmong culture we'll be talking about. Oh. Tales of a, uh, a sleep demon that can actually kill you in your nightmares. Perfect. So not which story is, uh, not sure which story is scarier and no little story, bigger story this week. Both stories have quite a bit of meat on them. Okay. Okay. Well, before we get going, let's address my news anchor blazer. I like it. Sexy news anchor. Hey. Uh, I, I'm going old school. I've mm, got the, unicorn. the unicorns. Okay, They're good. back. Good. And... Uh, is it time for me to get cozy? Yep, get okay. cozy, get cozy, because I'm about to begin. Okay, peepers, get your blankets out if you're watching on YouTube. I've been getting sweet messages. This is the cue. This is the moment. <laughs> well, and there's a little bit of setup before we go into, you know, the uh, the tale about voodoo. Oh, okay, yeah, give me some background. I so, would love that. So, so do you believe in the power of voodoo? I, I, 
I think I do. Right, the power of like a voodoo curse. I, I mostly think I believe in it because of American Horror Story and Angela Bassett. Man, she fucking got me. Okay, okay. So, so would you like? Would you be able to laugh off a voodoo curse if it was like a voodoo priestess, or would it scare you? Uh, Do you think there's a possibility in that power? Okay, I think it would depend on the person, and if that person had like a history, if 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 a voodoo queen priestess mm-hmm. cursed me, and someone else was like, "Oh, you are in for it," like You'd be she's. Right, as opposed to like, oh, that's just crazy Beth Ann who changed sure. her name to priestess, blah, blah, blah. You know sure, what I mean? Sure, like, sure, So that would matter. Um, so if it was like legit voodoo practitioner, priestess, you, you could get, get nervous. Yeah, it's the same way I would feel calm mm. if a priest with a really mm. reputable background and like good reputation in the community, if he if he blessed me, I would also feel more calm. Okay, okay. okay. Fair. Well, uh, yeah, fair. Uh, back in the early 1900s around New Orleans, uh, no, Louisiana, voodoo was commonly, if not always, openly practiced among many members of the African-American community. Um, with, with voodoo, um, everything belongs to the spirit world. Okay. Humans are spirits who inhabit the visible world. Only a thin veil separates the visible world and the unseen spirit world. Two planes of existence, kind of one overlapping the other. Of Some, you know, well, I guess not some, all voodoo priests and priestesses claim that they can walk in both planes. That's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So the unseen world populated by the Iwa, the spirits, the Miste, the mysteries, the uh, Anvizib, the invisibles. Okay. The Zanj, the angels, and then the spirits of ancestors and the recently deceased. And all these spirits are all around us all the time. And the primary goal of voodoo is to serve these spirits. Okay. I do totally believe in the like um, recently deceased. Like okay. you haven't lost anybody super close to you like, as an right. adult. But right. I will tell you that when someone dies... You kind of feel them around you. Okay. I think. For me. That that's how I feel. Yeah, yeah. Uh well, the, the the priest and the priestess, you know, they offer prayers and perform various uh, devotional rites to God, the Christian God actually, and then also to these particular spirits in return for health, uh protection, favor. Practitioners of voodoo, priests, priestesses perform rituals. Sometimes they invoke various spirits to take possession of them. Okay. In order to help cure others or themselves, or sometimes to enact harm and vengeance on others, to curse sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With voodoo, one can either work with spirits for good or spirits for bad. Okay. okay, And and a voodoo priest or priestess can work with both, can work on both sides. Oh, they can be good and bad. They can go back and and bad. And that's kind of like, you know, around today's story. Okay. Uh, uh, Believers think that curses, yeah, can be placed. And, And some think that just outside of New Orleans in 1915, one voodoo priestess unleashed a curse that completely destroyed a small coastal town. Oh. Yeah, so time now for the tale of voodoo priestess Julia Brown's last curse. Manchek Swamp, known by some as Ghost Swamp, is a swamp just northwest of New Orleans, Louisiana, known for its murky water and eerie-looking cypress trees with big clumps of Spanish moss dangling off of them. The marsh is home to alligators and cottonmouths and other creepy bugs and critters infesting the dark, dank, and shadowy brackish water. I already like it. Many locals consider the swamp haunted by all sorts of ghosts. And the most famous is the ghost of the voodoo priestess, Julia Brown, whom, according to legend, cursed the swamp just before she died. And the legend goes something like this. It's a legend backed up by a lot of eyewitness testimony and documentation, I should add. Julia Brown, known most of her life as Aunt Julia, was a voodoo priestess who lived near the edge of the swamp and worked in a little town of Frenier, Frenier at the edge of Lake Pon Chartrain. A little town with no electricity or running water that was connected by the railroad to New Orleans, which was 25 miles away, a town of cypress loggers and cabbage farmers. Aunt Julia was well liked by the residents for many, many years. She would help mothers during childbirth, aid in the curing of illnesses and infections that were difficult to treat and manage. She was a colorful local character known when she wasn't helping with her spells and charms to set out on her front porch, play her guitar, and make up and sing songs. I love her. But then, based on local rumors, the locals began to take her help for granted. And Aunt Julia began to resent them. Towards the end of her life, to openly she began to openly predict when tragedies would befall local residents and the town began to fear their once beloved local voodoo priestess. According to numerous reports, in the summer of 1915, residents of the little town heard the now 70-year-old Aunt Julia singing some pretty dark lyrics that had everyone more than a little concerned. She sang, One day I'm gonna die, and I'm gonna take the whole town with me. Oh? She would sing this little refrain, I guess, often. Holy shit. uh, That summer, and then on September 28th, Aunt Julia did die. And that night, 
a massive Category 4 hurricane approached towards the unsuspecting uh, city of New Orleans -uh. and the little town of Frenier, like that night. The next day, during the funeral of Aunt Julia, the storm hit Frenier. (gasps) Weird. The town of Frenier and several others in the area were completely destroyed by 145 mile per hour winds, hundreds died. The October 2nd, 1915 edition of the New Orleans Times-Picayune described the scene of Julia's funeral. Uh, A little warning here. The article was written with some old-timey, racially offensive language. Their words, not mine. Okay. Said, many pranks were played by wind and tide. Negroes had gathered for miles around to attend the funeral of Aunt Julia Brown, an old negress who was well-known in that section and was a big property owner. The funeral was scheduled, and Aunt Julia had been placed in her casket, and the casket in turn had been placed in the customary wooden box and sealed. At four o'clock, however, the storm had become so violent that the Negroes left the house in a stampede, abandoning the corpse. The corpse was found Thursday, and so was the wooden box, but the casket never has been found. So a huge storm hits during her funeral. Oh, so the casket's in a wooden box. I guess so. That's just, I don't know. That's just how they wrote it. Okay, okay. Yeah, I actually have no idea. Yeah. Uh, Locals who survived tried to rebuild the little swamp town again after the storm, uh, but it didn't take. Too many either died in the storm or decided to never return, most simply abandoned the Manchek Swamp, which had become a hot spot for paranormal activities. Did Julia actually curse this land with some kind of voodoo black magic? And now, some think that the ghost of Aunt Julia haunts the swamp to this day. Sightings continue to occur. Like this one posted on Reddit in 2015 by user Boobaloo the Stink. Terrible username. <laughs> but a good spooky story that I've edited a bit to get rid of a lot of the boring introductory details. So here's what this Reddit user says happened to her and her husband just a couple years ago. She wrote, I'm a little new here to Reddit, so I don't exactly know where to post this. I've read some stories here in No Sleep that are genuinely freaky, but some of the stuff I've read here seems made up. No offense. Other stuff seems like it could be so genuine, so I'm thinking this is where I spill the beans? If not, can someone kindly direct me to where I should post what happened uh, somewhere else? I was hoping someone had a similar experience in Ruddock, Louisiana. Uh, Ruddock, by the way, a, a little ghost town, basically about a mile from the little ghost town of Frenier. Okay. Same swamp. Or maybe somebody can point us in the right direction to help us get a little closure on this. This happened around a month ago. My husband and I are from North Carolina, but my mother recently remarried and moved to Hammond, Louisiana. I'm also pregnant, desperately needed to take a vacation and see my mom because we were both really miss each other, and now she can't be with me all the time. Kind of sucky, but it was a great excuse to go see my mom and her new husband and go to a Mardi Gras parade in New Orleans since it wasn't far away. We slept in the next morning after the parade and ate breakfast before making the drive back to my mom's house. It's not a very far drive. It took us about an hour or a little more to get to New Orleans the day before. But I guess I had too much water and orange juice to drink with breakfast, and I knew I wasn't going to make it back to my mom's house without needing to do my business. Traffic was awful trying to get out of New Orleans, and we got lost once trying to figure out how to get back on the interstate. So needless to say, I had to go. Badly. We saw an exit sign for a town called Ruddock, so my husband took it in the hopes it had a restroom or a gas station. From what we could see, which was nothing, there was no gas station or restaurant or anything. So we kept driving down this little road just in case uh, and ended up at the edge of the water. It looked like a boat launch where the road disappeared unceremoniously into the swamp water. My husband said we could turn back and find another restroom, but there was no point. I was going to piss all over myself before we found another exit. I asked him to guard me so I could squat and do my business just in case someone else decided to drive down and launch their boat. As I'm squatting and trying not to pee on my shoes and on the other side of the truck, I heard him give a strange laugh. He suddenly jogged around the truck and gave me a smile like he thought something weird was happening. You know her husband here. Uh, We've got company, he said, and looked back around the truck. He seemed perplexed but amused. And of course, I tried to finish as fast as possible and wipe with some fast food napkins (laughs) while he waved his hands to rush me along. I figured whoever it was actually coming to greet us, whoever it was... I figured whoever it was was actually coming to greet us and I didn't want to be caught with my pants down, literally. I tidied up and followed him around the truck and was kind of relieved to see it was a little old lady walking towards us slowly and awkwardly as little old ladies are wont to do. Where did she come from? I asked my husband, 
He shrugged and gave me a sideways glance that said, fucking beats me. But when she waved us, waved at us, we both waved back like it was the most normal thing in the world. We didn't feel threatened in any way. My husband muttered, yeah, yeah, lady, we fucking see you. And I hit him in the arm so he'd shut up. She looked like any regular old lady. She was African-American and had thin white hair and wore a big sack-like dress. It kind of broke my heart to see suddenly that she wasn't wearing any shoes. She waddled closer and I realized how rude we were being and I pulled my husband out to meet her stride. I later figured out we both thought she had Alzheimer's and had somehow wandered away from her family. But it occurred to me how very odd it was seeing this uh, as we were seeing her as we were miles from civilization in the heart of the swamp. And I couldn't see how this lady could just wander down the interstate without someone noticing. It was very clear to us that there was no town of Ruddock. Nothing. Just a railroad track that runs parallel to the interstate and a boat launch. It was kind of unsettling. No houses or signs of life anywhere. When we got close up to her, we knew with swift embarrassment that she stunk. It made me recoil, and my husband told me later that he hadn't ever smelled anything quite like it. There was something acidic to it, like bile and sweat. I knew we had to help this lady somehow because she obviously had been wandering for a while without shoes, possibly for days. Hello, miss? It's kind of chilly out here. Are you all right? My husband asked as kindly as he could. We were both having trouble trying to stay upwind of her smell. She smiled at us and showed us a few yellowed teeth. I had a creepy feeling about her suddenly. She told us her name was Aunt Julia <gasps> and just kept rocking back and forth on her feet. Uh-uh. My husband kept talking to her and asking her if she needed any help, but all I could do was stare at her because something was very, very off. Still to this day, I, I can't describe what was truly wrong with her, but it wasn't Alzheimer's. She held up a hand to my husband's face and interrupted him mid-sentence. He was telling her he was going to call someone for her to help, probably some, some nice police officers. Then Aunt Julia beckoned us to follow her. Instantly, we were both on high alert. My husband told me to keep calm and stay with the truck so he could figure out what was going on, but I held onto his hand because I didn't want him to go with her. Let's just call the police and wait here, I begged. She's just a little old lady. She, she's wandering away to the water. Look, let me go bring her back if, if I can, and then we'll call someone, he assured me. He followed her out to the edge of the road where the water met it. No! I did too. He didn't really feel like arguing with me, so he didn't say anything when he saw that I had followed. The little old lady pointed at something off in the distance in the water. My husband and I both squinted really hard, but all we could see was something bobbing in the distance. I took him with me, she what? said. Her voice was stronger and way more menacing than I could have possibly imagined. Took who, ma'am? Please come back to the truck. We, we want to make sure you get home safe. My husband continued to try and reason with her. I took him with me. Just like I said I would, she nodded. No. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. She looked so angry. It was extremely unsettling, and I watched her rock back and forth on her feet in that restless way. And that was when my husband said, Oh, my God. Oh, 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 shit. Go back to the truck, Kay. W what? What's going on? Call 911. That's a fucking dead body, he shouted, pointing at the thing in the water. Ah. Aunt Julia started cackling like someone you would hear in an insane asylum, and we both froze, me watching her and him watching the body floating and bobbing up and down in the swamp. Shut the fuck up! It was a very angry laughter that pricked the hair on my skin uh, more than the body in the water. I realized she was out of her mind, but not in the way some old ladies are. I took him with me, she laughed, and several more bodies bobbed out of the water like submerged corks. I felt my stomach roll and my husband and I retreated from her. I called 911. I tried to keep my voice steady. I explained that we'd found an old lady wandering around by herself off the Ruddock exits and there were a couple of bodies floating in the swamp water. I stayed on the line and the operator uh, and with the operator for a few more minutes describing several of the bodies, women, men, possibly children. I remember breaking down on the line with the emergency operator because of the smaller bodies I'd seen. It was very hard to describe how horrified and upset I was. I also described the old lady and that she seemed to be claiming responsibility for it, but I wasn't sure. I made sure to explain to them that there was something very, very wrong with her. As I was relaying our location again and our names, my husband kept an eye on this creepy, laughing old lady. She never did stop laughing and repeating about how she took him with her, even when the first police car showed up. I know the officer saw the bodies. He even managed to smooth talk Aunt Julia into sliding into the back seat of the cruiser. As freaked out as my husband and I were, it would be a huge relief to at least be able to sleep easy later that night, knowing that we had helped a crazy old lady get back to wherever she belonged and help solve some obvious deaths. 
We chatted with the officer for a little bit, and he assured us that everything would be taken care of. He took both of our statements. Soon another cop showed up, and the first one went to check on the old woman. And that was when we all noticed that Aunt Julia was gone. Oh, dear. She'd vanished from the back of the cruiser. The first officer noticed that the floaters he had seen in the water when he first arrived were now gone as well. Just vanished. Both cops looked everywhere, totally confused. The first officer seemed especially upset, and then the second officer took our numbers, told us to keep our phones handy, and they would call us for more information, but that we should leave. So we did, and the police never called. It's now been around a month since it happened, and we still talk about it and try to piece together what we'd seen and what happened and why the officers told us to leave and what happened after we did leave. What the fuck? Eek. Eep. I did not see that turn of events. I mean, I obviously knew that Aunt Julia was dead. Like, when they said that, I was like, oh, this is where it stopped. For many, many years, yeah. Oh, you mean at the end there where she just vanishes, yeah. No, 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 no. When you were like, oh, and then she said her name was Aunt Julia. I thought the story was going to stop there. I did not see her going to the water. And then like, okay, she's just going to walk into the water. and She's just going to evaporate. The fucking bobbing dead bodies. What the fuck? Can you imagine if you if you had that experience after knowing about that story? Well, if that happened, we could just never new- move to New Orleans. I could never go again. It's fucking it. So Why do I want to live there so badly? Are the spirits all calling the, me? Maybe, maybe. Fuck. I, I got a few. Uh, this first this first picture will show is the map of the area. I just did a little um, screen grab here. Okay. So where that little red marker is, that's Frenier. And that's what Lake Pontchartrain um, and then, you know, there's the bay. I bet, there I bet you're New butchering Orleans. that. Did you check the French I, on that? I, I did. I listened to a couple of videos to say it, and but then I can never remember and right. like, you know, when I'm actually saying it. So, yeah. And, and then, you know, one thing I will say about pronunciations is in some locals would be like, actually, it's pronounced this. It's like, yeah, with oh, yeah. your accent. You, like colloquialisms. I'm not, I'm not from New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm probably, you know, supposed to say New Orleans. But I don't. But I don't live there. It, it's kind of that thing. It's a weird thing with pronunciations. Where um, I always think of a Mexican restaurant randomly, where it's like when some people are, are ordering their food and they're not native Spanish speakers, but they try to like put a little flair on the. And you, you just know, sound like a fucking gringo. You just sound idiot. like a douche. You know when you're <laughs> it's trying. Like, sound like me. <laughs> el, I have the. Uh, I'll, have, I'll have the um, el pollo. It's like yeah, easy, buddy. You can just you can just say pollo. You don't have to try and like really or or whatever. You don't have to you try. You just say chicken. You know chicken. You can I say chicken. chicken. They they know chicken. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> right, right. But uh, this the, now this next photo now, isn't this a creepy? Now this is the swamp. This is that man check swamp with it, the, the, the oh man oh, the I was, mist. Okay, so I was so confused for a second. So for those of you watching on YouTube, <coughs> the swamp is so. Did you doctor this photo at all? Uh, no, but maybe the person who took it did. Because uh, it's just it's it's so bright green. Yeah, whatever uh, kind of algae or something on top of the water there. I I, I didn't think. I thought this was a painting, first of all. Mm. And then second of all, I thought, like, is that lime green carpet? Like, I don't oh, even yeah. understand. It is thick, now, thick, thick. Now, I'm sure that's not like, it's, you know, it's probably at a certain time of year when some kind of algae or something blooms. But it but just, still. I just like the the eeriness. Uh, of sw- and just having been through a uh, swamp tour together yeah, yeah, yeah. down there. I mean, th- it is eerie, a swamp. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you start to think about what it would be like oh, when right. it's dark out. Oh, or just to be out there uh, off the boat. I mean, when we were doing our swamp tour, I was like, man, if this boat like broke down, like, oh, we got to walk. I'm like, fuck that. I'm staying on this boat. Or if the boat started to sink. Ah, uh, they're just. I, there's I just, so many fucking gators. There's so many gators. creepy you know, gators and spiders, like Ooh. giant Ooh. spiders. I was just thinking about and, and the, the uh, snakes. No, I was thinking about. I mean, obviously, like when you go on a swamp tour, if, if yeah. we have any fans from the south in the south, I'm sure you're mocking us that we paid money for a swamp tour, but we did. Right. And and it's I not know what we're used to. <laughs> right. And I know that the alligators in the swamp. I, I wouldn't say that they're. Um, it's not like the zoo. Like they're not. Uh, you know, bred and trained, but they are used to like coming up by the boat, and they kind of mm-hmm. have a relationship with the <coughs> the boat, the people that run it, right? Because they like feed them yeah. food, right? Okay, so anyways, my mind goes to immediately just fucking how like those things go bink straight up out the water, oh, yeah. and how fucking big their mouths mm-hmm. are. Like if I'm in a swamp and a boat sinks, like. I'm I'm just gonna panic. It's just oh, gonna yeah. be over for me. I'm not gonna make it. And those hogs. You should just go. Boars out there. So oh, many yeah, things. Those fucking wild boars. Uh, the, the <laughs> yes, yeah, so many creepy. Uh, I mean, if you were out there again, like especially dark, it's hard to walk around. The, the mud Fuck. is kind of like quicksand in places. I mean, it's just the swamp is just a terrible place to have to try and walk through. And, I, and I'm sure people living down there, are like, yeah, 
Nobody would want to just walk through that. No, I mean, who are people walking through swamps? Nah, for, well, people used to have to try and escape and different things. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, I mean, like modern day. Also, yeah. by the way, like uh, the picture one back of yeah. the swamp. Is it okay that I thought it was also so beautiful? Oh, it's also beautiful. Oh, for <laughs> like, sure. Oh, like, yeah, it's beautiful. I love that. Uh, now, this next picture, this picture is the Frenier Cemetery. Basically, all oh, that's okay. left so of the town. So, 1915, is that... Yeah, that's a, the year the hurricane hit. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, I mm-hmm. thought... I don't know what I thought it was. Like, a, I thought it was a grave marker or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, wow. yeah, but yes, yeah, very beautiful. Very, very beautiful as well. And then one last swamp picture. Uh, this is the only one I could find. Other, This is Swamp Ass. Nice. I tried to find... Um, I tried to find a, a picture of like a, you know some swamp that got I couldn't find a good one and that got me to thinking about swamp ass and then I googled swamp ass and then that's what you got this, I got some other you things. you couldn't get that, a nicer ass well oh yeah there was like the pornish type pictures oh I of, didn't want that my god but, but then there was this one guy but I the resolution wasn't good enough I wanted to show one but I his was more of he just he shit his pants ew I don't want to see that, that. Was swamp pants that swamp ass. Yeah. Swamp pants. Swamp pants. He wasn't he was wearing swamp pants. Uh for anybody who is just listening right now, uh starting this week, you can find those images on our Instagram. Those oh, will be fun. <laughs> just watching your classes are all <laughs> uh, okay, that story. Yeah, interesting. We hadn't done a voodoo one here, you know, and, it, well, uh, and and the and the curse combined with that person that you know on Reddit that posted the the encounter that mm-hmm. they're claiming with Aunt Julia. I thought it was just a nice little combo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really creepy. Um, I wonder if there's any descendants of that town around. You know, there are. I mean, because it's it's not that long ago. There is on YouTube if you want. I, I didn't watch the video, but it came up when I was doing uh, research for this story. Uh, the great great granddaughter of Aunt Julia. Oh, uh, dang! P- posted some video. I'm, I'm guessing talking about her. You know, her great great grandmother. I want to know if there are any descendants of people who lived in that. Mm, I'm sure. I'm sure of that little Frenier. Yeah, Frenier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so a couple things. Okay. How many times have we, like, pulled off on the side of a road to oh, go to yeah. the bathroom? Oh, sure. Many. There's just so many instances where, like, that's your only option. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about where Dan's from in this tiny little town. And it... Sorry, that's my chair. Oh, I was like, what was that sound? Um, you know, this tiny town in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, there's still life in Riggins, right? I mean, there's people still living there, but, like... Between Riggins and let's say like McCall, Idaho, there's plenty of like, this is nothing, nowhere, no people around, fucking creepy as shit. I think about like Winchester or like, you know, some of these really small little towns Mm -hmm. that we've driven through that are just old and desolate or maybe just like one house. And yeah, I mean, that's exactly like you get off the freeway, you have to use the restroom, the gas station's closed, like you're stuck. and. She said she was pregnant, like the right. whole thing. Like I can imagine this whole thing going down. They they weren't seeking it out. They weren't um they weren't ghost hunting. Yeah, yeah. I now, mean, and, and that would be so weird in one of those little isolated areas just to see anybody pop out of pop out of like, you know, like like if they didn't drive there, you'd be like, How did you even just get here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that part uh, made it a little eerie as well too. Because uh, it, was, it wasn't like it, it's not an area where there's a lot of houses and stuff now. Right. There's right. no reason for anybody else to be there on foot. So I, I thought it was <laughs> I was getting so mad at the husband or boyfriend, whatever he is. Right. Uh, oh, I'm going to help her. It's like, because I can totally see you doing that. Like, being sure, sweet little an, old lady. Mm-hmm. But I'm telling you, babe, if we're in the <sighs> middle of fucking nowhere and someone just poof shows up, mm-hmm. get in the fucking car and get the fuck out. Or, GTFO. Or just do whatever they say. Just assume that they're, you know, they're sent to me for a reason and I need to follow their every command. Dude. Mm-hmm. Dude. Maybe that's how I'll react. And then just leave me high and dry? That's what, that's what they tell me to do. They're my master now. You're an idiot. This is why you <laughs> men die in these stories. Because as he was going with her, and I was like, God bless right. America. Don't leave your wife behind, you fucking asshole. She's pregnant. Mm-hmm. She can't run. Like, if that happened to us, and one of those things was talking to me, I would just, you know, have to assume that it was too late for you. And I got to save myself. Dude. And I got I to gotta do whatever it wants. Shut up. No one wants to listen to your bullshit nonsense. You would be freaking out. I'd be freaking out. Exactly. Yeah, I'd be freaking out. Talk a big game, big no, tough. No, no. I'm big tough man. I'm not scared. No, I'd be, I'd be freaking out. I'd be, You'd I'd be just joking freaking around. the fuck out. Yeah. Just like you were last night. I know. I know, because you get all spooked, and then it, it pisses me off because it gets me spooked. <laughs> what, what happened last night is, like, she's up working on these packages, and then our, one of our dogs went upstairs and just, like, popped in this upstairs bathroom. That's not even what fucking happened, because you weren't okay. in the God-blessed house. I asked 
stand to go get something from the truck because I, the mm-hmm. Dan parks in the driveway and I'm a fucking baby. And ever since the black eyed children, I cannot go in the driveway at night. Even when we <laughs> pull into the driveway and I'm like, oh, babe, let me check the mail. Uh-huh. I'm also like, oh, God, oh, God, this is when they're going to show up. Dan's going to go in the house and they're going to come ask for directions. <laughs> so I and that's it. Like, I mean, it's the Pacific Northwest, so it's yeah. dark at 430. So this could sure. be at like six o'clock. Like sure. I'm not going outside by myself late at night. I won't even go in our garage. Late at night, as you found out last I night. Know. So Dan, I was like, hey, can you go grab that stuff from the truck for me, please? Mm. Dan goes outside. He exits the house, and we live in a split level. And so when you're on our main floor, and you look up the first, or the first, the only set of stairs going up, and you look to the left, is a bathroom. And there's a big mirror on the wall, okay? And that, is like, it freaks us both out at night. Because if you're sitting in the right position on the first floor, and you look up, no matter what, daytime or not, yeah, it's a, daytime, it, it, it can be a little eerie. Is that yeah, because it like the the light from downstairs mm-hmm. catches the mirror. Okay, it's a whole thing. So Dan leaves the house, and within one point one seconds, Ginger runs upstairs, and I hear the creaking of a door, and then I see a light go on that was not on before, and I hear <laughs> that you didn't think was on before, and then I hear the bathroom fan go on and I'm like what the fuck <laughs> and then I'm just sitting there staring at it like oh my and god and you thought you heard the fan go on so Dan comes back inside and I'm yeah. like babe did you turn the light on in the hallway and I'm tired I, I was about ready to go to bed before this so I'm already tired I want to go to bed and then and then I get spooked because I'm like oh shit no I, 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 I had no, it up that is for not a while. your reaction your reaction is like stop it yeah, stop got- it you get so mad yeah yeah, because I thought you were just—I thought you were getting worked up, and then you're working me up. I was worked up. Something fucking weird happened in that house last night. No, it didn't. But then, so then, what happened was, so then I start getting worked up, and then we're both feeding off each other, and then I did remember, like, oh yeah, you had cut your finger earlier in the evening, and they got a little bandaid on, and so I went up there and got you a band aid and hydrogen peroxide, and that's when I and I always turn the fan on whenever I go into uh, the bathroom, and I turn on the lights and the and the everything. You do not always turn the fan on when you go into the bathroom. I think I do. You do not. I think I do. You don't. Well, I did last night. I don't think you did. And I'm, t- I let you. She's trying, to, she's trying to drive me insane. No, I let you convince me last night because I also didn't want to be freaked out because I knew I had to stay up late and I knew you were going to bed and I didn't want to be scared and the only one awake in the house. But as I was sitting at the kitchen counter last night doing work, it felt fucking creepy in the house. And I just mm-hmm. kept saying my like, I am surrounded by positivity and light. I am surrounded by positivity and light. And in, in picturing myself surrounded in a bright white light, that's what keeps you safe. Okay. <laughs> oh, sweet Christ. Are you, ready? Are you ready for our next story, you weirdo? <laughs> what if I just do the whole story Great. like, Great. <laughs> you can't enter my light. Okay halo thing okay well you're gonna want to keep your light halo thing on because this this, my cross this next this next monster if it is real is homicidal oh kill you Mm -hmm. this is gosh dang i I like both stories today i like the first one a lot this one i like a little bit more it's just so it's different it's very different oh dear what if a nightmare could kill you this is exactly and a little bit of exposition here to start this one as well too because we got to talk about the mong people so this story will make sense so what if a nightmare could kill? This is exactly what many people believed to over 100 Laotian Hmong men in the late 70s and early 80s across the United States, various war refugee relocation areas. Between the late 70s and the mid 80s, at least 117 young, seemingly healthy immigrants from Southeast Asia, all Hmong peoples from Laos, uh, all but one of them men, most of them in their 20s and 30s, they all died in their sleep. Many died with terrified expressions on their faces. Many of them were heard screaming right before their hearts stopped beating. And they died within just a few months of making it to America almost every time. None of them showed any signs of illness prior to dying, but they weren't well. They were all afraid. Afraid specifically of dying in their sleep. Some were so afraid of dying in their sleep, or more accurately of being killed in their sleep, that they would set their alarm clocks to go off every 20 to 30 minutes to avoid falling into a deep sleep. That's fucking awful. The Federal Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta conducted an intensive inquiry into the manner in which these seemingly healthy Laotian refugees died mysteriously, and one possibility explored was that they were literally frightened to death by nightmares. I don't know. Oh, this story. I mean, if you're not sleeping, of course you're going to die. You'll die of exhaustion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you, well... 
maybe I don't know. Actually, they've done sleep studies and you can't just like uh, keep yourself awake until you're dead. You just you'd eventually just fall asleep. Oh. But, but I just think it's interesting that the Centers for Disease Control actually looked into nightmares, you know, just intense fear killing these people. Do we trust the CDC? I do. Uh, Minnesota medical examiner. Dr. Michael McGee, who examined four of the bodies of these men in St. Paul, Minnesota, troubled by not understanding how they died. He said in a New York, uh, to a New York Times reporter, I know what they didn't die of. They didn't die of getting shot in the head, stabbed in the heart. They didn't fall off the roof. They didn't get poisoned because we did an autopsy in each case and we got a big zero. Hmm. U.S. film director Wes Craven read about some of these deaths in the L.A. Times, and the story inspired him to write the slasher flick A Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, yeah. The beginning of the iconic horror franchise that launched the career of Johnny Depp also introduced a new monster to the world, Freddy Krueger. Mm-hmm. Right? The monster in the fedora hat, striped sweater, razored glove, the Springwood slasher who can and will kill you in your dreams, the monster behind the haunting song. This one scared the hell out of me as a kid. One, One, two, two, Freddy's coming for you. Three, four, better lock your door. Five, six, grab a crucifix. Seven, eight, gonna stay up late. Nine, ten, never sleep again. Those little girls singing that song. Oh, that creeped me out. Uh, Do you want to know something? What? I've never watched a Freddy Krueger movie. Huh? Okay, yeah, but you still knew of some of that song, yeah. Uh, yeah. Craven was inspired in particular about the tale of one young Hmong refugee child new to America who was terrified to fall asleep because he was afraid that he'd be attacked in his dreams by a monster and never wake up. For days, he fought sleep with everything he had, told his parents he was afraid that if he slept, this, this thing that was chasing him in his dreams was going to catch him, was going to hurt him or worse. And then he finally did fall asleep, and late that night, his parents heard screams coming from his room. Oh, no. By the time they made it to his room, he was already dead. His heart had stopped beating. He'd literally died screaming in the middle of a nightmare. I think I'm good on this. So what happened to him? What happened to all these other Laotian young men? I... Are you going to solve the mystery? We're going to look into uh, Hmong culture. We have to look into the Hmong culture a little bit to try and answer this question. Oh, boy. And then we'll tell our tale. The Hmong are a Chinese ethnic minority group that originated in the Yellow River Valley area of China thousands of years ago, then migrated to Laos, Vietnam, southern China. Their culture developed with with very little influence from the outside world. As the rest of the world moved into the Industrial Revolution, the Hmong, for the most part, lived comparatively very primitively. Their language only began to be written down in the last few decades. Prior to the 1960s, almost no Hmong, a notoriously clannish culture, lived outside of Southeast Asia. Okay, okay. And this all leads to our, our tale. Mm-hmm. The Hmong were persecuted in Laos in the 1970s after a North Vietnamese-backed communist regime won out after a 16-year-long civil war against royalists in that small landlocked Southeast Asian nation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Hmong had been recruited as early as the 60s by the CIA to fight North Vietnamese soldiers during the Vietnam War. More than 30,000 Hmong soldiers helped the U.S. fight communism in the Northern Highlands, where they farmed and they lived, and where they died at a rate 10 times higher than their American counterparts. Wow. Yeah, and very sad. In 1975, after the war, Laos became a communist nation, and the Hmong were viewed as traitors because of their work with the United States Intelligence Agency. Huh, interesting. Up to 100,000 were captured and executed for end- ending up on the uh, losing side of the war. Mm-hmm. Thousands of survivors, you know, flee their homeland, become refugees in Thailand, and then eventually many make it to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And most of them brought their traditional religious beliefs with them to the U.S. Okay. And a fear of monsters, part of those beliefs. The traditional Hmong religion is animist. And it's not really a cohesive religion. It's just various interpretations of this kind of spiritual sense, believing that the spiritual world and the spiritual interconnectedness of all living things, even seemingly non-living things, have souls. Everything has souls in Mm -hmm. their worldview. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Humans mm -hmm. are the most spiritually interconnected beings of all. The Hmong believe that the human body is the host for not one but a number of souls. And the isolation or the separation of these souls can cause disease, depression, even death. The no, tra- thanks. The traditional Hmong uh, do not believe in a separation between spiritual and physical ills. And at the center of Hmong spiritualism is the shaman, the master of spirits. Hmong shaman are viewed as both doctor and priest, and they perform curing rites called soul-calling rituals to heal the sick, lure lost souls back to their human hosts. In these rituals, they, Hmong... They lure 
these lost souls that get separated back, from your body back, back in, into you. Mm -hmm. They don't exercise them. They lure them back in. Mm -hmm. You have to have all these fuck. souls that are supposed to be inside of you, you know, to be whole. Get and the you, fuck and, out of and here. And you do have a soul, from what I understand. I mean, it's a little bit confusing. From what I understand, you do have a like a primary soul that it would be equivalent to what uh, Judeo-Christian people think of their soul. This is too much already. So yes, it's very interesting. Uh, in, in these uh, rituals, these shaman rituals, the, the shaman will go into a trance, use a small wooden bench, no wider than a human body as a flying horse, to transport themselves from this world to a spirit world. That's what they call it. I'm sorry. I know. I don't mean to be I know, disrespectful. It's, it's, I know. That it's, very, it's very interesting. Kind yeah. of hilarious yes, thinking yes, of that. Yes. But they transport themselves from this world to a spirit world full of ghosts, <laughs> ancestors, <laughs> demons, other creatures, both good and bad. Buffalo. I mean, it is, you know, it's, again, it was d isolated as it well, came. It's, it, it's very fo it folklore. Harkens, yes. Yeah. It harkens back to a much more simple time. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. A buffalo horn tips thrown by the shaman to the ground to determine where lost souls have traveled. The shaman wears a cloth mask, not only block out the real world, but also act as a disguise uh, for from evil spirits in the spirit world. It's the job of the shaman to protect their people, uh, the people of their village from spiritual harm, from the attack of evil spirits. But when the Hmong fled Laos, not all of their shamans were able to flee with them. Okay. So these new immigrants suddenly find themselves in a new land where they don't know anyone. Oh, yeah. They don't know the language. They don't know the religions. Right. Nothing feels like home. You know, they, and they feel very uh, alone, isolated, and also spiritually unprotected. Ooh, right, right, right. Right. Back in Laos, the Hmong had uh, felt protected not just by their shaman, but also by the spirits of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. Another part of their spiritual beliefs. And now they have been cut off from their ancestral spirits, spirits that had previously helped protect them from the attacks of evil spirits. In traditional Hmong beliefs, there are many different sogs or wild spirits. Mm -hmm. Most of them are harmless, but not all. Some of them are evil and some of them can kill. Okay. And the Hmong worried that their protective ancestral spirits were bound to their homeland, unable to cross the vast ocean, separating Laos and the United States, unable to come and protect them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Initially, some of these refugees also took solace in thinking that maybe the demons of their homeland would also be left behind. Demons like the Sog Swam, the evil spirit who smothers. And encounters with this particular Hmong monster are what I want to talk to you about today. Time now for the tale of dreams that kill. Vang Yong was one of thousands of Hmong starting out in America. While he was trying to build a new life in Chicago, Vang was also battling an old visitor from Laos, a spirit visitor, the ancient spirit of an angry old woman, a Sog Som, also known as a Dabsog. Dab One night, shortly after his wife and kids had gone to sleep, Vang finally was able to lay down for the night himself after a long day at work. Shortly after falling asleep, he began to dream of a tall, white-skinned female spirit who came and laid down on top of him, he said. He said that her weight made it difficult for him to breathe. He tried to call out, but could only manage a whisper. He tried to turn onto his side, but couldn't. Her strength was immense, inhuman. She firmly pinned him down. He said she continued to hold him down for what felt like about 15 minutes, her black, lifeless eyes staring into his. She smiled a dead smile. He felt the life slowly drain from his body. He felt his soul being taken from him. She was stealing his very essence. And then Vang woke up screaming. Convinced if he'd slept much longer, he would have never woken up at all. Vang had barely survived his visit from the evil spirit who smothers. Vang had nearly been killed by what he and other Hmong refugees were beginning to call the nightmare death. A death that had taken at least 18 young Southeast Asian men's lives in San Francisco in 1981 alone. Dr. Shelley Adler, a professor and anthropologist who teaches at the University of California, San Francisco, interviewed a number of Hmong immigrants in the late 80s who'd been visited by the Song Swam and published a book of interviews in 2011 called Sleep Paralysis, Nightmares, Nocebos, and the Mind-Body Connection Studies in Medical Anthropology. And here are some of those stories. Jia, uh, Jia Neng Her was a shaman in his former life across the Pacific as was his father. And he experienced three or four visits from the Sog Swam, AKA Dab Sog, back in Laos, beginning in 1962. Gia said, the first Dab Sog that came to me, and those are interchangeable terms for the same creature, Dab Sog or Sog Swam. Okay, thank you. The first Dab Sog that came to me, I remember I was in the jungle. It happened more when I was not at home, when I was sleeping in the jungle. I was lying on my back and I felt that someone was coming and lying down beside me. Then someone was lying on top of me. It felt so heavy. I felt so scared. I tried for a long time to move. After a long time, I could move. 
Then I could see no one. My friend that was next to me was still asleep, but Dab Sog was not there anymore. Hmm. Chu Lor was another Hmong man who arrived in the United States in 1979 who told Dr. Adler that he was also visited by this nightmare monster four times. He said that he was visited by the Sog Swam the, for the first of four times at the age of 19 or 20. Chu remembers that he was not feeling well at the time of the first attack and he had gone to bed earlier that evening than usual. Although his encounter took place more than 35 years before his interview with Dr. Adler, he could remember it like it was the night before. Chu said he was in his bed when it happened. There were people at the other end of the house that were still awake and he could hear them talking. He could hear everything. He could hear the voices of his family. And then he felt the presence of the Sog Swamp. Then he saw it enter his room. He said he suddenly saw the outline of a large body. It made its way quickly over to his bed and quickly climbed on top of him. Its form was hard to determine. It was human-like, but not shaped like any human Chu had ever seen. It was bigger and less clearly defined. It was dark, but not entirely composed of shadow. It was monstrous. It climbed on top of Chu and he tried to fight it as it pinned him to his mattress. He couldn't move. He couldn't talk at all. He couldn't yell or make any other sound, or at least he couldn't in his nightmare. In reality, he was making all kinds of noise. Oh. By the time it was over, four other people from down the hall had come inside his room saying, you made all this noise. He told them he was trying to fight a spirit that was big, black, hairy, with teeth, big teeth, big eyes. He was terrified, but he lived. Dr. Adler asked him if he thought that the Sog Swam could have actually killed him, or if it just frightened people. Chu told her that the Sog Swam always scared you, but doesn't always kill you. He said that people usually don't die the first time it visits you. But if you don't go to a shaman and they don't help you, it will come back. And after a few visits, it can definitely kill you. It grows angrier and angrier with each visit. Is it because it is because a debt has not been paid? A sacrifice has not been made. And if the shaman can't figure out why it's angry and what it wants, it can and will kill you. That's crazy. Another Hmong immigrant gave Dr. Adler a more detailed explanation. Chia Vu had left Laos in 1980 and after living in a Thai refugee camp for a year, came to the U.S. After making it to the U.S., he was visited twice by the Sog Swam. On the night of his first Sog Swam encounter, Chia was laying in his bed, worrying about his new life. He had just turned off all the lights, had drifted off to sleep when he felt it. Suddenly, he couldn't move. He couldn't see it, but he could feel it. He tried to move his hand, but couldn't. He was paralyzed and petrified. He knew that a Sog Swam was upon him. He started to struggle to breathe. He felt so alone, so scared. He thought, who will help me? What if I die? Well, he didn't die that night. (sighs) Several nights later, Chia was attacked again, though. This time, shortly after falling asleep, he felt as though he had woken up, but into a nightmare where he was still in his apartment. And this time he saw it. A shadowy creature approached him. And he got up from his bed and then it pushed him back down onto his mattress with great force. The wind left his lugs, he struggled to breathe. In his mind, he screamed, move, move, but his body would not listen. Chia felt overcome with terror. The Sog Swam had returned. Again, he was alone, and again, he felt so helpless. He tried to move, he tried to kick the spirit off of him. Nothing, it was too heavy, too strong. Finally, he was able to move, first his legs, then his arms. Suddenly, he could move his whole body again. He was able to push the dark spirit off of him, and then he watched it run away. He was able to find a shaman after that, and he had the Sog Swam, uh, you know, went through some rituals, and it never returned. What the fuck, man? Gia took these attacks very seriously. He said he knew people who had died in their sleep, people who had been young and healthy but haunted. The Sog Swam had visited them, they didn't take it seriously, and then it took their lives in the night. And he knew that it seemed, for whatever reason, to take uh, at least two nightmares before it really became serious and life-threatening. Hmm, that's weird. When he told Dr. Adler all this, she asked him why it would become worse after the first two non-fatal attacks. Chia told her it was because once the Sog Swam found you, it kept coming back until you did what it wanted or until you died. Dr. Adler asked Chia why they would come for someone in the first place. Right. And he told her that they generally came from someone or for someone when they failed to perform traditional Hmong rituals, when they failed to pay respect and make symbolic sacrifices to the spirit the spirit world, their ancestors. He said that at least uh, once a year, evil spirits must be fed. A tribute must be paid. And if you forget to feed them, they will come for you. Also, you must feed your ancestors as well so they can protect you from spirits, especially from the particularly malevolent Sog Swam. Chia said that in Hmong culture, 
It is the duty of the father, the head of the household, to feed these spirits. Okay. He is responsible for the rituals and for the protection of his family. And that is why when the spirits come, they come for men. Mm -hmm. They will only come from a, come for a woman if she is the head of the household. And Shia thought the attacks were common in America because many of the Hmong people were abandoning, abandoning their traditional beliefs. They were forgetting their rituals. Shia also said that Hmong men were especially afraid of Song Swan because the spirits didn't just kill you. They took your soul. Now for one final encounter. These people are very afraid of these things. And I'll talk about that after the story a little bit. Uh, now for one final encounter. Laotian Neng Q came to the U.S. in 1983 after spending four years in a Thai refugee camp. Shortly after arriving in the U.S., the Song Swam came for him as well. He said the first emotion he felt when he saw it was shock and then fear. Neng had been working long hours and was exhausted, and when he went to bed the night it came, uh, he had wanted, he'd been thinking about wanting to go to school, but not having enough money. He kept waking up and thinking about this and other problems. Yeah, just stress. Stress, yeah, exactly. And after going back and forth between being awake, being asleep, he hears a noise in the room. It sounds like something or someone is moving about in the darkness. When he tries to turn his body to get a closer look, he can't. He's frozen in place. Then without turning his head, once his eyes adjust to the darkness, he can still just barely see in the corner of his room a dark shape coming towards him. It walked over to his bed, towards his feet, then crawled up onto his bed, pulling itself up onto his legs. Get the fuck out! It was very heavy, its weight pressed against his legs, then his stomach, then his chest, crawling up on him more like a giant snake than a person. Ugh. It then began to put all of its weight into his chest, pushing the air out of his lungs. It felt like his chest was suddenly frozen. It felt like he was drowning. Nang tried to yell so someone from his family sleeping in a nearby room would hear, but no noise would come out. He tried with all his might to move and fight, but his body betrayed him. Eventually, he just gave up and waited to die. Oh, God. He thought, what can I do? And then, after what felt like an eternity, the Sog Swam just went away. <sighs> he got up, turned all the lights on, was afraid to fall back asleep. The next day, he found a shaman. He told Dr. Adler how important that was. He said, some people are attacked several times. You have to do something. Call a shaman. Make a sacrifice. Change the place of your bed. Recurring attacks must be prevented, ideally by establishing why the creature is coming for you with the help of that shaman. Or by appeasing the spirit with a sacrifice. At the very least, you have to try to trick the spirit. Because if it continues to come for you, eventually it will kill you. So is this all, as Dr. Adler and many other doctors believe, just a bunch of sleep paralysis combined with a genetic heart defect that can cause the heart of a seemingly healthy person to stop breathing? Okay. Or is it something far, far worse? Is the Sog Swam some sort of real-life Freddy Krueger? Are some people quite literally being scared to death? Remember, their faces are locked in expressions of terror when they die. The last sounds they're heard making are scared screams. Can a bad dream, a really, really bad dream, actually kill you? Eek. Uh, so, um, couple pictures. Okay, I already have so many visions in my head. This first is uh, some depiction that comes up when you, you know, oh. Google Sog Swam. What? Pretty that is creepy. not what I was fucking thinking, and I do not like that. So creepy, right? Fuck that. Sometimes it can be an old woman. Sometimes it can be whatever the fuck that is. Well, I'm not looking at that anymore. That is fucked up. That's like shadow person-esque, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, which I yeah. was not thinking. God bless America. <laughs> I don't like shadow people. <laughs> this, God damn it. Make it go away. This next picture is- uh, <laughs> My own shadow just freaked me out. It's an old painting that comes up a lot in uh, you know articles about sleep paralysis and articles about the Sog Swam. This is this what, doesn't bother me. Yeah. This is fine. This is almost beautiful. Now this next one is uh, Sleep Demon Sog Swam. Okay, this is um, from from Reddit. A picture on there. Oh God! Right, isn't that creepy? Can you imagine that thing just coming up and laying over you, just with the black eyes? Oh my God! Well, that one looks alien esque. Yeah, who knows what these How things are. How do you are? find the images of the things that I hate the most <laughs> and then merge them to fit your fucking story? <laughs> it's pretty fun. Okay, this is this last one's a nice one. No, no kidding. This this is a little palate cleanser. This is uh, a Hmong baby in traditional Hmong baby clothes. Oh, hi, cutie pie. So a little 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 cute. Oh, that little baby's so cute. <laughs> Let's leave that up there. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Oh my God. Fuck you, Joe. Fuck you. God bless. So there is thoughts on this. I will say oh, to start okay. this off, 
you know, there there is thoughts that there is this genetic heart thing, which which is really no less scary to me, because what some people think uh, is going on here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that the belief in this creature is so strong oh. that people are really having real terrible terrible nightmares yeah yeah and then yeah. combine that with a possible genetic heart condition and they're literally scaring themselves to fucking death they're getting so scared they're having some kind of i mean but they don't really know but they're but, right. they, but they think it's like they're having some kind of heart situation like like i guess a heart attack a heart situation well they, but they don't say the autopsy that, that's what's so creepy about this so the, the autopsies don't say heart attack it doesn't say heart stroke? attack it, it, it just it references this kind of vague genetic heart malfunction where it can just it's not even like an attack like a clogged artery it's it's like it just stops beating but what's weird is that's combined with their their finding these people, or they were especially when they first came over from Laos. Yeah, yeah. You know, with uh, like terrified expressions on their faces, they're right. screaming. Super. Cr either way, like what? But I mean, whether it has medical basis or not, I mean, a lot of medical practitioners do believe that essentially, in some way or another, the nightmare is killing them. And how how terrifying is that? Well. <sighs> Yeah, just as like we're, I'm processing all of this and I'm just yeah. thinking like, I wonder if it's almost like um, panic attacking yourself to death. Because mm, that, that yes. wouldn't show, I don't think, I mean, I'm I'm no medical doctor here, um, <laughs> but I would think that, that that's not a heart attack, right. that's not a stroke, and I don't know, you can't do like an EKG on a deceased person, right? So you can't yeah. test the health of the heart when the heart is not beating, right? Right. But I'm just imagining like, these poor people, they have like left everything they know. And mm -hmm. like you said, they're in a place where they don't know anybody. They don't speak the language. They're without friends, family, and one of their right. most essential things, a shaman. Like yeah. they are away from everything, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're fleeing a, a, you know, a terrible regime. Right. Yeah. They're terrified. They're scared. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that they, even though they know no one right. is going to physically during the day come get them and like round them up and yeah. ship them back, I'm sure that there's a real fear of like, what if I get sent back? What if there's like some yeah. version of like a yeah. concentration camp? I mean, some of these people were in refugee camps. I'm sure mm -hmm, the living mm -hmm. conditions were fucking horrible. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're safe, but like I'm right. dirty and scary, right? Like in, yeah. a, in a very real way. So if that is what you have just escaped and you are all alone yeah i'm sure you're having nightmares and in my mind you are so panicked and stressed how am i going to pay the bills sure. do i go but like all the things that we worry about but just super fucking heightened yeah and yeah you i i, I imagine that you could work yourself into a panic attack quite easily mm -hmm. and then that and and, and, all, and and I just want that justification right. because I I feel like doctors could say like maybe that's what it is. Sure. And since they're not saying that, I'm going to say that because it's going to help me sleep tonight. Well, and, and I think it's that like we've talked before and you've you know teased me about that when you open the door, you know, when you believe the power yes. of belief. And I know that you like, you know, being raised Catholic, you know, mm -hmm. you're especially scared by exorcism tales. And, right. And, and, and that stories of that ilk. And, and I. And I think that you still believe that if, you know, if you're open enough to that, that you could let one of those things in. Absolutely. So I think, you know, why can't the same thing go on with Hmong culture? Where what if, what if, you know, just yeah. going through this, if they're, if they believe in it so much and they're, and they've opened that door that they're somehow allowing. Just got the chills. This real creature to get into their nightmares and, and take them, you know, take their life away in their, in their sleep. Well, and cause how many how many people? What, Over 100, 117. I mean, that's a lot of people. And that was from the uh, mid-70s to like the mid-80s, you know? And, and and who knows how many people weren't um, categorized that way. It's not like right, right. they had some, you know, uh, way to, to tell. Since it's, since it's a mysterious death, right. it would be hard to compile all of that data very accurately. It's like adult SIDS. Right. Which I know right. that, by that, that, name. No, that comparison was made uh, yeah. in many articles. Yeah. And also, that's, this That'd is just- be like, What would it be called? Be called SADS? They do Sudden have- Sudden adult death syndrome? Well, there is a name, and now I, I have to look it up. I didn't write it in the notes, but there is a name for this, you know, that they've given like a vague term yeah. to describe these types of deaths that I don't can't pull uh, out of my ass right now. But there is- um, Similar deaths occur uh, have occurred with Cambodians, like fleeing the Khmer Rouge, ah. and then coming to the U.S., and then also um, various like uh, uh, Filipinos, you know, in certain traditional beliefs down there. Uh, I'm just certain, trying to think. Certain ethnic groups in, Fil in the Philippines have also had this experience. And I worked I with a guy who believed in this stuff. Oh, really? That's what I wanted to remember to talk about afterwards, yeah. Oh, I want to hear about that. I was just thinking, 
if there were environmental causes, like they were exposed to certain kind of like poisonous gases or. They looked into that. I do remember that in the research uh, specifically. Yeah. And they'd say like, because there was like, you know, gases and stuff used over there, like with the yes. Vietnam War and all that. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Th- th- what, what didn't make sense about that was, is why would it manifest itself almost exclusively amongst men? Because men right. and women were both exposed to that. And why yeah. would it have latent kind of uh, effects in that way? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And, and they, you know, there were, there were autopsies done on a fair amount of these people and that didn't come up. So I, they don't think so. They don't I'm, think so. I'm curious if we have any listeners who believe in this. And like, I'm, I'm curious if if you have like, uh, I don't know, like do you get tested for something? I mean, maybe, uh, obviously not. Yeah. My mind, I don't know why I went to like the African-American community and they're predisposed to sickle cell anemia. Oh, right. But, well, there, but that's there is, diagnosed. There is, and, I can't remember the term for it, but there is a, again, it's kind of vague. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. almost like, I feel like it was almost called something like um, Southeast Asian Heart Center. Like, like they don't really like know. It's, so, it's such a stupid name because they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. But there is, they do think that there is some kind of predisposition to um, a very specific type of of heart condition <sighs> in Southeast Asian men, but but again, it feels like they're kind of grasping. They don't they don't really know. That's a part of the story. Is well, it seem, it's, it's a mystery. And and the screaming face, you know, like the the face of yeah, terror. the face of terror. I mean, to me, that's just you know you're gonna die. Like if you feel like you're suffocating, yeah. I wonder if it's less of a heart problem and more of a lung problem. Have they looked? I mean, I'm I sure they have. So. I, yeah, I don't I'm, think so. It's not like. What I'm saying here is... Yeah, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. Uh, I worked with a guy... Yeah, tell me about that. Uh, this is right... This was my last year in college in Spokane, Washington, where there are some Hmong people, um, refugees, who, who made it over to this area. Okay. And there was a guy, Sivu, and C was uh, one of the Child Protective Services social workers. Oh, yeah. You've talked about him before. Yes. Yeah, so I was kind of... I was like... In a, I was like in a, when I worked there, I was like a... Just a work-study job, but basically I was the assistant to a whole unit of about 12 social workers. And okay. so, you know, they would, various ones would pull me to come along and follow them and do various jobs or help them out if they needed help. Okay. And I remember uh, I remember Sivu talking about... I don't think it was the Sog Swam, but there's, you know, there's other evil entities in that. And he was a traditional, you know, he still practiced the traditional beliefs. And I remember him talking about, like, making paying tributes. Yeah, so, so what does that kid, mean? What do you, like, what do you do? That would take a whole not long, you know, exploration into their actual religion, so which is curious. which is like an anthropology kind of, you know, study. Because yeah. it's not, um, there's not. Time no, suck. Right. For the other podcast, time suck. Um I think it's more like incense and things. It's not like they're okay, cutting a goat's okay, neck. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that's not, I wasn't picturing yeah. like cutting a goat's neck, but I just wondered like, you know, like when you go and I, I apologize Symbolic for- Symbolic tribute, yeah. Yeah, and I just like, I apologize for my ignorance on this, but I'm thinking like if I go to like some like Thai or Chinese restaurants, they often have like the little like cat. Um mm. It's like a little oh, statue. Oh, yeah, a little incense guy, yeah. Yeah, and, and then like there will be other little statues and there will be incense right. burning and right. there's usually gold coins or yeah. money. And I, I'm, I've I'm i never looked at it closely because I feel yeah. so rude being like, hey, what's in there? Based on pictures I've seen, there's all kinds of – it reminds me of, again, with Catholic kind of like the um, – especially uh, – the the more like Mexican Catholicism where there's all oh, yeah, of the little oh, I can't think of it right now. I either. can think of that little sh- that little shop next to the taco stand. Is yeah, what I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm, where there's all the little like saints and stuff that you're yes. supposed to pay tribute to, and you light all the various candles. We could do that in in regular Catholicism as well. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. You have the patron saint of this and the patron saint of that. Right. And it's like when like a little shrine is set up. Mm-hmm, yeah. I saw like I saw a little shrine set up in various YouTube videos uh, for you know Hmong people, and it's a small okay. ethnic group, so there's not a lot of info out there. Is it a religion that will die? Uh, it's 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 akin to um, like American Indian religion, spiritual beliefs. I, I was There's wondering no central if it was, text. Yeah. Again, the, the, there wasn't a written language until very recently, so it's a little bit more loosey goosey. Yeah, but yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, and and I remember this Sivu guy uh, was. I remember he brought up some spirit that he had seen, this like shadowy entity, and I started laughing. I mean, I'm 22 years old, Dick. not raised on this stuff. Well, yeah, I just thought like you know like what do you? I thought he was kind of being silly, mm-hmm. and he got like. Very serious. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this dude believes this stuff a thousand percent. Right. So, yeah. Interesting stuff. <laughs> Sometimes when you're telling me stories to, like, keep myself from going too far down a rabbit hole, I'll think something ridiculous. Yeah. So when you were talking about feeding it, I really just want to be like, well, give it a fucking cheeseburger, man. Just set a little cheeseburger out like, by your bed. <laughs> Here, Sock Swam. Do you like honey Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. <laughs> now I'm picturing just like this super scary, creepy, evil entity just like... Can you give just, it a Big Mac? Yeah, starting to come in your room and then it just like sees the burger and just kind of loosens up. It's like, oh, thanks, bro. And then just like <laughs> snacks the burger. So how's things been? Good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. No need more about Sock Swamp. Did, and then he just takes his burger and leaves. When you were researching, were you thinking of the ring? 
No, thank God. That's a, that's immediately my mind was like, uh, fuck. That's a, that's a good yes because uh, most depictions of the Sog Swamp are that it is a female entity, white dress, uh huh, blacked out <laughs> face. <laughs> yeah, I hate that image. Yep, yep, yeah. Okay, would you like to hear some listener stories? I would. Oh no, are you creeped? Every once in a while, that image of the ring girl just freaks oh, me yeah. out. No, thank you. Remember when that boyfriend played that terrible joke? Oh, on, yeah. I mean, that was the best ever. I'd be so mad at you, but I also would be so impressed if you could pull that off. Yeah, elaborate. Oh, yeah, just really quick for what she's referencing there. There's, I think it's on YouTube still. I, I'm sure but, it is. But, but some guy, it was like uh, his, him and his, I don't know, girlfriend, wife, whatever. Yeah, um, living li- partner. Living partner, who knows? We're on the couch together, and I don't know what you call this setup. I guess like a loft. Where it's like a half upstairs, like just the bedroom upstairs. Yes, a loft. Okay, loft. So there's like a stairway behind their couch, TV in front of them. Mm-hmm. She falls asleep. He rigs some crazy paper mache doll, insane looking like movie prop of the ring, the girl from the ring, the horror movie, on a pulley system <laughs> that starts above, so the, amazing. above the TV and then and then comes up out uh, up towards the upstairs loft. So then he goes up the stairs behind her. She's down on the couch below him. TV's in front of them both. He turns the TV to static, just like the movie, really loud with remote control. She starts to wake up, and as she starts to wake up, he pulls the pulley, and it looks like that fucking girl from the movie (laughs) is literally – oh, yeah, he has it set up at the beginning of the TV. So it looks like she's coming out Out of of the the TV, TV, and she freaks out like I've almost never seen somebody freak out. Oh, it's so good. She screams like she's about to die. Oh, yeah, and then he goes – then he – even he realizes it went a little too far. Yeah. He runs down the stairs and starts to comfort her, and then she's like sobbing terrified well i know what that feels like (laughs) because you have scared me into tears before so i have are you ready i am so uh do you have your little squishy squish 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 i'm I'm ready to be scared okay so just as a a little callback to a previous story Mm -hmm. i just want to say this story particularly freaks me out because now amongst our fans we have two people who have seen the same thing uh, and, not, and and it's not just one thing, it's two things. And it's very specific. So if you remember, uh, I think it was think. last week or the week before. The old man and the boy? Yes. Damn it. Living in the apartment, right? We had this sweet little family and their, I can't remember if it was their son or their daughter, uh, didn't want yeah, to sleep. I, I think it was story. their daughter. It was their daughter, right? And she was like uncomfortable in her bedroom, right? Yeah. Okay. So I get this email. King and queen of the suck. I want to share a story with you about what happened to my nephew, Sebastian, Sebastian, who they call Seabass. Such a cute nickname. Another reference to Time Suck, but everyone's like, can you this suck? Who are they? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I, I think people know at this okay. point, like, well, I guess if you're just tuning in for the first time, yes, Dan hosts another podcast. We're not making weird references here. <laughs> my sister Lexi and her husband TJ were living on Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri at the time, and my brother-in-law was in a crew chief for the bombers that fly out there. They were living in base housing and it was a relatively new development on the base with really nice homes. One October, Sebastian didn't want to go into his room, not day, not night. He said it was scary. Assuming it was just a four-year-old not wanting to go to sleep or to just avoid playing in his room for whatever reason, Lexi and TJ were patient but firm when it came to going to bed. He was struggling with night terrors at the time as well, and he would wake up screaming in the middle of the night. One morning, after a particularly bad night, Lexi asked Sebastian, What are you afraid of? He said, Sometimes a little boy named Jamie comes and talks to me. Jamie is nice but there's also a man with him sometimes his name is also jamie and he is really mean mommy lixi would put a small toy in front of his door to keep his door propped up at night on three separate occasions she got up in the middle of the night for whatever reason and the toy was moved to the opposite side of the room and seabass's door was shut Uh. one night their dog sadie started barking for no reason TJ got up and went to see Bass's room and Sadie was staring at the ceiling in the corner of his room and would not stop barking. They ended up having to put Sadie in the laundry room for the evening and took Seabass out of his room that night. This went on through the holidays that year and in January of the following year is when it got really scary. My sister always checks on her kids before going to bed and one night at about 11 p.m. she went to check on Seabass. Yeah. As she was tucking him in one last time, she noticed a handprint on his left 
forearm. Oh, my God. Lexi woke up Sebastian and asked him what had happened. Sebastian said that Big Jamie came in through his window and grabbed him really hard. She then picked up Sebastian and slept with her and had him sleep with her and TJ. The following morning, my sister asked him what Jamie had looked like and asked him to draw a picture. He said that Jamie was big and looked like daddy's hair, but all over. Lexi then asked if he was all hairy. Seabass explained that he was just all black. Fucking shadow person alert. By this time, they had had enough and asked their local priest to come over and take a look. The priest didn't notice anything but decided to do a blessing over the house just the same. He did this thing and then nothing else ever happened ever again. Curious as to what it might be, Lexi did a a little digging on this. After a pretty quick internet search, she found out that the local police department had been called several times over the past year or so from people seeing a small blonde boy walking into the woods with a man in a black trench coat. What the fuck? Not sure if they were who Jamie was talking about, but it was enough for them to attribute it to what was happening. The crazy thing is, is there were no reports of any missing children in the area, and I guess all the children were accounted for on base. Before the priest came, Lexi would find Sebastian sleeping in different spots in his bedroom, and for some reason, he preferred his room to be completely dark at night. She tried to leave a light on for him, but he would say it was less scary when the room was pitch black. After the priest came through, though, he slept in his bed every single night and said it wasn't scary in his room anymore. He was only four years old at the time, so I don't think he really understood what the priest was doing there. But he knew his room was now less scary, and he never saw either little Jamie or big Jamie ever again. Yeek. Luckily, TJ is now stationed on the West Coast. So the whole family never has to go back there again, and nothing has ever happened since. And then a sweet note from our friend Seth, who sent this story in. This is by (sighs) far my favorite podcast, and I sometimes set my alarm for 1 a.m. on Tuesday night so I can listen. My wife is not a fan of the alarm going off at 1 (laughs) a.m., so I sleep on the couch on those nights. Oh, my God. Yes, I have a scared-to-death problem. Love you both. Best regards, Seth. Wow, Seth, that's creepy. Creepy. Joe, if we can God get a picture, duh. can you see those marks what? on his arm? Mm-hmm. And what? Because we'll, I, I was thinking it was like maybe the marks were like like little kid sized. No, Th- those are not little kid those sized. Are not little kid sized. <laughs> and then the next one, yeah. Joe, there, there's two photos. And it, no, it, no, no, it, I mean, it's no. No, no, no. Thank you. I mean, that is a definite fucking red handprint. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. And then and then what really got me was the the police reports of the dude and the kid walking out into the woods at night together. Fuck. What the fuck? What the fuck? So I mean it, Yikes. like do you think that someone snuck into their house and was trying to take their kid? I don't know. But he didn't describe him like he was a regular looking dude when he makes right. the all black description. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with some of these stories. I secretly hope that we have more fans out there who've also had an (sighs) an encounter with a big guy and a little guy because... I'm going to lose my shit if that guy comes to our house. He's not coming to our house. I have protected our house. Our house is so safe. I hope so. If one of those guys comes to our house, I'll finally... I'll go in on the crystals. (laughs) Okay. That's what it'll take. I have to see for sure a scary monster, and then I'll give it a shot. What if I see it? Nope, it doesn't count to me. You, it has to be you. It has to be me. Okay. I'll just assume that you're crazy. <laughs> awesome. That's so nice, honey. I love you too. You're so, you're so sweet. <laughs> really? Huh? Next level. Hmm? Okay. Are you ready for one more? I am. Can you handle it? I can. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, our second story did really get me going. Uh, a fan, Paul, tells us uh, a story from his childhood. And I can relate in, in one way to... Um, He mentions this in the story. My mom did the same thing that when I became too old to sleep in her bed by by her standards, she would say, like, you can make a bed on the floor. And we did this with our kids, too, because it was like, fucking enough, you guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we need to sleep. Yeah. And eventually, uh, because I was convinced that our house was haunted when I was growing up. I would sleep on my mom's floor so many nights in a row that she would be so fucking annoyed that she told me (laughs) I had to make a bed in the hallway. Uh (laughs) And I was just thinking about that when I was looking at the story because I was like, how many times did my mom almost step on me? Like, no wonder she was so fucking cranky in the morning sometimes. Because <laughs> she would probably open her yeah, door yeah. and I would be there. And it was uh-huh. either like scary or like, God damn it, again? What yeah. is she doing out here? Right, right. 
So, uh, yeah, it's just pretty funny. All right. So uh, our, our fan and friend Paul writes, first of all, I absolutely love the podcast. Thanks, man. Thank you. Keep up the great work. Uh, listening has made me revisit something that happened to me when I was about 12 years old. I honestly don't remember what time it was, but I woke up one night and sat up straight in bed without any reason. I'm not sure why I woke up, but I can remember how quiet the house was. It was quiet until I heard what sounded like the handle to the front door of the house jiggling, like someone was trying to get in. Uh. I told myself I was hearing things until I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the stairs. Now, we lived in an old duplex, and I thought it could have been the neighbors because the house was mirrored itself. The house mirrored itself, and the staircases were only separated by a very thin wall. I chalked it up to the neighbors and forgot about it. This is, however, when it got really weird. My bedroom door started to jiggle. The handle was moving. I didn't have a lock on my room, so if someone wanted to come in, they could. But the door never opened. It just jiggled over and over Creamy. and over. I was so scared. It felt like someone had stabbed my heart with an ice pick. I was frozen and could not move. And after about five minutes, could have been less, so hard to tell, I mustered the courage to run to my mom who was sleeping in the room next door. I flung open the door and sprinted toward my mom's room and woke her up. I felt like such a coward. I told her I had heard something and was afraid to sleep alone. She told me I was too old to sleep in her bed, but that I could sleep on the floor of her room in a sleeping bag. So I set up camp in the sleeping bag and lay back down, feeling at least some comfort that my mom was close by. After about 20 minutes of trying to sleep, while my body was still pumping full of adrenaline, I started to feel very strange. Kind of like a dizzy feeling, but, but not exactly. It was then I heard a zipping noise right next to my ear. I opened my eyes to see that I was moving and the zipping noise was the sound of the sleek outer lining of the sleeping bag moving across the carpet. I was being dragged across what? the floor in my sleeping bag towards my mother's closet. Oh my God. And then nothing. It stopped. I don't remember anything after that except when I was lying back in the sleeping bag telling myself, it's just the cat. Nothing ever happened after that, but I was glad to leave that house. To be honest, I kind of forgot about it until all these e years later when I started listening to the podcast. Keep it up. Hail Nimrod, Paul. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thanks for listening to uh, Time Suck as well. Hail Nimrod to you. Man, the dragging thing. Can I you know. imagine having that memory of like, you know, whether it's a nightmare, like a really real nightmare or real that would haunt the shit out of you. Yeah. Well, yeah. And and also like. God. I, <coughs> being dragged towards the closet. Yeah. I I also the like. Jiggling. Things from like my childhood and different things. Like I'll read this. And I'm like, I'll, I'll have these little like flash memories. Almost like a deja vu feeling. I'm mm -hmm. like. Was, oh. I, was I dragged towards them? <laughs> well, not, not, yeah, not like so specific like that. Yeah. But like today, uh, producer Joe. Joe, you feel free to pipe in. Joe's ghost might be back in his house. I know. Did he, he said, tell you? Yeah, he told me right before, as we were setting up the lights and stuff. Yeah, uh, Joe, do you want to do you want to pipe in? Suppose so. It, it wasn't. I mean, if people did not hear the story before, uh, anyway, me and my daughter both heard a female voice in my kitchen say hello, mm -hmm. and that was a while ago. I, I forget what episode we talked about that, but yeah, that's, that's five or six back. Yeah, so it wasn't the it wasn't the same female voice, but I woke up in the middle of the night a couple nights ago, and I was in the bathroom going pee, sitting down because men sit down when they're tired. Sure. Okay. 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 On your phone. And, no, it was too late. Texting I was super Dan. sleepy. Okay. Um, but right outside the bathroom door, I guess heard a, a female say, "That's okay." Oh my god. And, I, and I, my my initial reaction, I just went, "No, <laughs> like oh leave me not, alone. Not again. Get out. Not Get again." Out. So well, anyway. But wow. when Joe was telling me that story this morning, I was like, "That feels weirdly familiar." So I just I, I'm thinking about Paul's story because. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we push things down in our subconscious, right? Like we don't want to remember. It was too scary. I, I do think that the veil is thinner for children, right? Children are more mm -hmm. open to it. They're not as jaded. I think that's why there's more instances. And and the community in general around spooky things would say sure. that's a very common thought. That's a very th common conception that children are more susceptible or more open to it. And so Joe was telling me that today. And I'm like, did that happen to me? Did I 
tell him that story like I had a mm. weird thing and so I think you know for Paul I'm like yeah I get it you start listening to this stuff and it yeah brings something back so it's messing with your mind and bringing up old memories eek, eek. Woohoo! feel a little spooked I do I do I got, I got good and spooked with you yeah I feel um th- yeah that first story uh <sighs> I'm hoping that the next time we're on any sort of like road trip, long drive, that I just do not remember that. Yeah. Oh, wow. the lady and the bodies in the water. Eek. Oh, well, that's all. For, that's all for today. Now, now you guys are getting all kinds of stories. You're sharing stories. We're sharing it with other. I, I love it. We've got four good scary stories today. Mm-hmm. Just some interesting things to think about. I li- I liked actually in particular today learning the backstory of Freddy Krueger because I thought that was all just out of Wes Craven's mind. Oh, okay. I didn't cool. realize it was based on any kind of real event at all. But, yeah. You know this L.A. Times article that he read and you know got got him thinking and that led to Freddy Krueger. I love those backstories. Yeah, yeah, me too. Do you realize that next week we'll be dropping an episode on Christmas Eve? Oh wow, a Christmas Eve. Okay, I have to look for uh, some kind of a tie-in if possible, because we're gonna because we're, we're gonna put out an episode where you know we're still gonna kick it out for Christmas I mean, Eve. We'll, so, we'll be here getting scared if you guys want to get scared with us. Please do, please do, please keep sending your stories into my story at scaredtodeathpodcast dot com, and then also any anything else send to info at scaredtodeathpodcast dot com for Lindsay. Send it to me. Follow us at Scared to Death Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks to the team, the Bad Magic Production team, Harmony Camp, Joe Paisley. We got uh, Heather Rylander. We got Zach Flannery. So many people helping out. And subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch the show. Uh, thanks to Z- uh, Joe Paisley, Zach Cohen, and Jeffrey Montoya for their sound beds. Good job. I thanked Heather Rylander, right? You did. Okay, you great. Did. Everyone's you... been thanked. Everyone's Every, been thanked. Everyone. And thank you, fans. Thank, thank you, you, creepers. And uh, pe- creeps. Creeps. Whoa. Whoa. Creeps and peepers. Eek. Creeps and beavers. Should he be fired for that? No. Feels feels not okay. How you dare know what? you? You know what? Next week I'll have the uh the ghost that I've been sending to Joe's house tell the stories in my place. Oh my god, be the so ones great. that I the ones that I conjured specifically to Do you think it's him. Millie? Do you think do you think Joe think takes I, Millie home from the studio with I, him? I come in here in the middle of the night and I've been working on a lot of like invocation spells and stuff cool. to, to terrorize both you and Joe. So I'm glad that they're working. Thanks yeah. so much. You bet. You Thank bet. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and beavers. Hope you were scared to death. <laughs> Bye guys. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.